Welcome back to Presume Legal. I am Misha Janice, and this is the recap of trial day 10 in the Karen Reed case. Grab your red solo cup, pour yourself a drink, and let's recap. We started the day with Brian Albert's cross-examination, and it did not start well for Brian. Defense counsel started by asking him when last he'd spoken with the prosecution, to which he said in 2022. But further questioning revealed that he and the prosecution had met a lot more recently, like a few weeks ago, in order to prep for the testimony in this case. He said he mistook the attorney's questions because he wasn't asked about prepping. He didn't think prepping included speaking with the prosecution. Okay. As I said, not a good way to start your cross-examination. So he testified that he and Brian Higgins, who he was with earlier that day, that Friday, never spoke about Karen Reed, who we heard in the opening were Brian Higgins and Karen Reed were having some flirty text messages together. There was a lot of questioning about the witness's knowledge of Karen Reed because of prior grand jury testimony that made it unclear whether he knew her, knew of her, had met, had never met, or had met once prior to the night that John died. Ultimately, I think the truth lies somewhere in the middle. He knew her, but barely. We heard about the Ford Edge again. He said he drove it home from Waterfall that night, and after he parked it in the driveway, after Higgins had backed out his car to allow the Edge in, Brian testified that he never drove the edge again that night. Now, this is important because we're supposed to hear testimony from the snowplow driver that overnight when he plowed the snow on Fairview Drive, he noticed the Ford Edge not in the driveway, but over on the other side of the yard, basically over close to where the property line was, where John's body was discovered. So. That's an interesting tidbit to keep in mind. Now, a lot was made about Sergeant Lank's report that was created after the, the group discussion at 34 Fairview early in the morning of January 29th. You'll remember the Alberts, the McCabe's, and Brian Hagan were all there having a group interview, I don't know, with Lank. Lang's report stated that the witness's daughter, Caitlin, left the house about 12.15 a.m. when she was picked up by her boyfriend, Tristan. The witness, however, as well as his wife, Nicole, who testified last week, both maintain that Caitlin was the last person to leave at about 2 a.m., not 12.15. So this inconsistency is something to also keep in mind moving forward. Like his wife, Nicole, the witness also explained that he never told Lank, Proctor, or any other law enforcement, anybody else, that his nephew, Colin Albert, was at his house that night. So the witness was asked about Chloe the dog and the timing in which she was given away. We know that after John's death, the dog escaped the backyard and got into a dog fight, which sent two women to the hospital. It was also around the same time that the defense started asking questions about John's injuries and those scratches that were on his arms, making queries about the dog's whereabouts. So the defense tried to establish that that was the reason, not due to the dog fight, that the Alberts decided to send the dog to another state. So what was the real motive in getting rid of the family pet? A dog fight? or some involvement in John O'Keefe's death. Next, we got a bit into the layout of the home, including the basement, where we learned that it could be exited through the backyard, which is on the same side of the house where John O'Keefe was found. We haven't had any testimony yet about anybody being in the backyard, but the defense has consistently raise questions about the basement with different witnesses. So we still have to see where they're going with that. The witness was asked about his career as a Boston police officer in 2022 when the incident occurred. 
The witness served in the Fugitive Task Force, where he not only responded to incidents, but also conducted investigations. He was a supervisor investigator, actually, but testified that although he didn't have any training, like formal training, about how criminals cover up crimes, clean up blood, sanitize, or get rid of electronic data, he did learn about those things through common sense and experience. Speaking of electronic data, defense counsel asked about the witness's cell phone that was used at the time in question. And just like that, objection, sidebar, attorney's approach, jury, out. We have another voir dire on our hands. Once the voir dire started, we hear about a preservation letter that was sent to this witness from the prosecution on September 23rd, mandating the preservation of the witness's cell phone and all data associated with it because there were defense motions trying to get physical access to that cell phone. The problem is Brian Albert had gotten rid of his cell phone. When? One day before the preservation letter was sent. Yes, the day before the preservation letter was sent, he just so happened to decide to upgrade his phone. He returned the cell phone used at the time in question back to the cell phone, cell phone provider. The cell phone was not preserved. The witness testified that he never received the preservation letter, but he still heard about it during a conference call that was held by the prosecutor. And to make matters worse, he didn't tell the prosecutor that the cell phone that was being used at the time was gone now. We ultimately learned that the defense motions to get the witness's phone were denied, but it still smells very fishy to me that one day before the preservation notice was given to him, he just so happened to ditch the phone. So now we have a ditched phone in light of a preservation notice, a ditched dog that was a beloved pet for six years, a house that had been in the family for two generations being sold all of a sudden, and a 30-year job that he's retiring from. Now, are these just normal life events or intentional actions that have an underlying motive? But wait, there's more. So, by the way, all the voir dire testimony was allowed to be heard by the jury. So imagine hearing all that about the preservation notice, et cetera, and then learning about discussions that this witness and Brian Higgins had after John's death, discussing getting rid of their phones. Yes, folks, Higgins got rid of his phone too. Let's pause for a moment and talk about the witness's bedtime habits. He testified that he always sleeps with his cell phone and glasses next to him on bed, in, on the bed. No, not a nightstand, not charging somewhere, next to him on the bed. He said that both he and his wife sleep with their phones in bed between them, between their bodies. This, I imagine, is how he explains how what he said next is possible. He testified that he inadvertently butt dialed Brian Higgins at 2.22 a.m. on the night that John went missing and was found in his front yard. In an earlier hearing, the witness testified that the call happened, this butt dial call, happened during some bedroom cardio with his wife. Despite that, he said he did not speak with Higgins. Now, I needed a pause for a minute. I needed a break when I heard this. Sila, because now we have yet more overnight phone calls being made, yet nobody's speaking to each other. Rewind, Brian Albert and Brian Higgins butt dialing, calling each other. In the bed next to him, Nicole Albert is getting called by Jen McCabe, missing those missing that phone call. Julie Albert is getting called by Jen McCabe. It just seems like a lot of cell activity in the middle of the night on this particular night. There were actually two calls, the initial butt dial from a locked phone position 
that lasted one second. And then 17 seconds later, Higgins called Brian, Higgins called Brian Albert's phone back, which connected for 22 seconds, but they didn't talk. That's what he testified to. We know that Jen McCabe woke the witness up after 6 a.m. later that morning by bursting into his room, letting him know about John, who was found in the witness's front yard and who was dead or dying. Well, who do you think the witness called first that morning? Hmm. One of his five kids? No. His brother, the Canton cop? No. One of his other six siblings? No. No. He he called Higgins, the person that he didn't talk to overnight, despite the two calls in his call record. The witness said he called him to let him know what had happened since Higgins had been hanging out the night before. He thought it was important that he know. Now, listen, this was not an easy cross-examination for the defense counsel. Brian Albert was, he was defiant. He parsed words. He did a lot of wordplay all throughout the cross-examination. So we finished up with Brian Albert Sr. And the next witness was Brian Albert Jr. On direct, we learned for the first time that Jen and Matt McCabe's daughter, Allie, was the person who picked Colin up from 34 Fairview that Friday night. We heard from, we had heard from Brian Albert Sr. about how Brian Albert Jr.'s friend, Julie Nagel, was in attendance at the house that night and went outside at one point during the gathering to talk to her brother. Now, the witness added to that testimony that when Julie went outside, he turned around where he was sitting. He was in the dining room, and there's uh, there's some windows that look out onto the front of the house. So he turned around to watch Julie outside talking to her brother through those windows. He said he noticed another unfamiliar car parked outside and he described it as a dark SUV. He said his uncle, Matt McCabe, also saw the vehicle. So I'm sure we'll be getting testimony about that as well, because I'm pretty sure Matt McCabe will be called as a witness. The vehicles, the mystery SUV and Julie's brother's car, were both parked with their passenger sides facing the house. He said at first, the mystery SUV was parked closer to the mailbox, which is on the side of the house with the driveway. And when he looked again, it had moved up closer to the flagpole. The flagpole is on the opposite side of the, the house. Julie came back inside the house after less than five minutes outside and the witness said that he didn't look outside again. Now on cross, the first thing we learned was that this witness was not interviewed by anybody in this case until July, 2023, 18 months after the incident and after the witness had already testified before a grand jury. So the Massachusetts State Police investigation was in super duper slow mode in speaking with witnesses. It was either that or that they weren't actually doing much of an investigation. Time will tell. He had admitted this witness that while he was able to see tire tracks in the snow on the street, he did not see a person laying in the snow in his yard either time he looked out the window that night. He also testified that he gets overwhelmed very easily and he did look incredibly nervous testifying today. And because of his overwhelm, he never went to look outside. He never even went to the window that morning after he heard what was going on. So he never went outside to look at the commotion and he didn't even look out any windows as so, uh, at least that's what he testified to. The next witness was Caitlin Albert, Jr.'s sister. Now, we've heard a lot about this witness already because she came up in Katie McLaughlin's testimony. But before we hear what she has to say about that relationship, on direct, she testified about the evening. Nothing contradictory to what anybody else said about the time 
at the waterfall, leaving the bar, going back to 34 Fairview, and who all was back at the house. She testified that she left last. So that's everybody now contradicting Lank's report, written report. Her boyfriend, Tristan, picked her up and when they were leaving, when they were driving away from the house, she didn't notice anybody in the yard either as they passed in front of the house. On Cross, we learned that the Massachusetts State Police investigation didn't get around to interviewing Caitlin until after her May 2023 grand jury testimony. And Proctor didn't speak with her until August 2023, which is even later than he spoke with her brother. So that's just incredibly telling uh, the extent to which they were turning rocks over trying to find who, you know, the people that were involved. So next we briefly got into the relationship with Katie McLaughlin, whom she called a friend of a mutual friend, but not a close friend. And that's when the judge called it a day and released the jury. After the jury left, the party stuck around to get back to the matter of the relationship in which the defense argued that they have classic impeachment evidence, multiple photos that they'd like to present to the jury, all based or because of the original testimony of Katie McLaughlin, the first responder and the only person who testified to directly hearing Karen make the alleged admission that she hit John. O'Keefe. Katie's testimony about her knowledge of who Caitlin Albert was, was phrased in such a way to misrepresent that relationship, really. And the defense wants the opportunity to impeach her with photographs that they have collected um, from different individuals and social media, these photographs depicting multiple social events that the two young ladies have been seen at um, as recently as I think 2021. So the judge heard both sides argue and said, I have a decision tomorrow. So that's how things were left today. Thanks for joining me for this recap of day 10. I'll see you again tomorrow for day 11 recap. Until the next drop, peace. <laughs>